Uh, hello everybody, selamat sore Bapak, Ibu, dan para mahasiswa sekalian. And good afternoon and good morning to you who's joining from outside Indonesia and especially Professor Ayers from uh, Netherlands. So I think it's quite early in the morning for you. And uh, so today is actually the second series of the guest lecture series that our department is holding. So before we start with this, uh, with this lecture, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Mahendra Wati, and I will be your host and moderator for today. Uh, allow me also to invite Dr. Mujahidin as the head of department uh, to say a few words before the start of the lecture. Please, Pak Muja. Yeah, terima kasih, Bu. Hello, uh, good morning, Mr. Haju. No, uh, yeah, in Indonesia this time this afternoon. Okay, uh, saya juga tidak lupa mengucapkan assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore kepada para hadirin, bapak ibu semua, dan teman-teman mahasiswa ya yang hadir pada acara ini. Terima kasih atas partisipasinya dan kehadirannya pada acara ini. Uh, Perkenalkan, my name is Mujahidin. I am a fan of Mr. Mahindra Wati. Uh, so in this morning or afternoon, uh, I thanks to Mr. Haju for this lecture on the process design lecture. Exactly, the topic in this guest lecture is the art and the science of the of process redesign. Uh, in this lecture uh, is the second event. That organized uh, by the Enterprise Laboratory, uh, which Enterprise System Laboratory is uh, one of five labs in my department. Uh, more, uh, moreover, we are directing and appreciate to Mr. Haju as uh, one of lecturer at this time. Uh, next, we hope uh, for Mr. Haju can join with our department to other events in this future. So uh, we hope this lecture about the process we design can beneficial and motivate us to conducting teaching and resisting yeah, in our department. Uh, again, I should thanks to Mr. Hajo. Uh, I miss Mr. Hajo and all attendants always healthy and happy. Okay, terima kasih. Terima kasih, Bu Mahindra. Thank you, Pak Muja. So um, now we can start with the lecture. But before that, uh, although I know that most of you probably has heard about Hayo uh, before, because he is one of the four uh, that write the book, the textbook of fundamentals of BPM that has been used as the textbook for BPM course all over the world, but allow me to formally introduce you about Hayo. So, um, of course, I cannot read all uh, of his CV, but Professor Hayo Ryers is uh, currently a full professor in Utrecht University, okay. Department of Information and Computing Sciences a position that he hold uh, since January 2019. Prior to that, he is also a full professor at Free University. And also he started his career in Eindhoven University of Technology, where he also obtained his PhD and master. He's also currently an adjunct prof professor in Queensland University of Technology and also affiliated professor in PS Business School. And professionally, before being an academic, uh, Professor Ryers also uh, worked as a senior consultant in Accenture and manager in Deloitte, head of BPM research in Perceptive Software. Most recently, he's also appointed as the uh, chief innovation officer of Process Diamond, uh, a software uh, in process mining. Of course, his teaching is mainly in business process management, among others. And he's also the head of the business process management and analytic groups of the Department of Information and Computer Sciences of Utrecht University. 
other uh, other things about Professor Ryers is that he is an associate editor of the Business and Information Systems Engineering Journal and member of editorial board of Computers in Industry. And last but not least, is steering group member of International Conference on Business Process Management Conference. I can go on with the introduction, but I'm sure that all of you are very keen to hear from Payo himself. So Payo, now I hand over to you and you will have a full, uh, um, I don't know, control of the, the lecture. You can divide it into uh, many sections where you can take a question and answer. And I also encourage the audience to ask question and put it in the chat, or you can raise your hand so we can give you the time to speak by yourself. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, uh, Mahendra. Mm -hmm. So um, let, me, uh, let me start. Um, selamat sore, uh, kesemuanya. Uh, saya senang sekali dengan perhatian Anda untuk kuliah online ini. Uh, juga, saya harap Anda dapat belajar sesuatu dari ini. Okay, that is that is the best I can do. Perfect. The That's perfect. perfect. In, the rest of the lecture will be in English. <laughs> so. What I will do today is I will talk actually about my favorite topic. There's a lot of things that uh, can be discussed when we are talking about business process management. It is in fact a very flourishing scientific discipline. But one of the most, I'd say, creative elements is to really think about how things which are already happening can be improved. And this is something which is very satisfying, but it's also very challenging to sometimes develop ideas on how things in the real life can be improved. So my purpose today is to give you a bit of an idea of all the methods that exist to make process redesign feasible. And as the title of my talk suggests, it's only partially science because we are, um, as a community, we engaged in developing methods, but we also have to rely on heuristics and uh, ideas which perhaps don't have scientific proof, but seem to work in practice. So in that sense, this is really a topic which is under development, but it's a topic which I really love. I'd like to show you um, a very, let me see, this works. I'd like to show you um, uh, a view of my city. This is the city of Utrecht. Uh, you can see me there in the small boat paddling to the university. No, this is, this is not really true. This is a picture taken in the summer uh, where people can actually uh, do these kind of uh, things. Uh, Utrecht is um, an old city. It's a medieval city situated in the center of uh, the Netherlands. The university itself is unfortunately a little bit outside of the city center on a campus. And it's one of the, it is, I think, in fact, the largest university in the Netherlands. What I'd like to talk about today uh, really centers around the concept of processes. So I thought it would be wise to devote a little bit of attention to what processes are. Uh, because processes are not the main view of how organizations, how organizations appear to many people. Many people, when they think about organizations, they think about the different departments which exist in an organization, the different managers, how the subunits, the divisions, etc. But when I look at organizations, I'm actually interested in the processes that flow right through these organizations. I'm interested in um, the cooperation between the different departments, the different specialists in an organization that that work together to produce products and services for their customers. Because it's very rare that one particular department in an organization can produce a product or service on its own. Um, for example, uh, there was a financial department which perhaps uh, registers an order. 
there is a scheduling department who has to, which is concerned with um, buying the raw materials to produce a particular product and make a schedule for the production of the goods which are ordered. Then there was a manufacturing department who has to, uh, which has to produce the goods, etc. A warehouse delivery, etc. All these departments have to work together to make sure that processes flow smoothly, which is in the interest of customers of these products, because they will only see a good end product if there is a cooperation between all these departments. So these processes, that is the center um, uh, of my attention during this, uh, this lecture. And that is um, what I hope you, uh, you can recognize when you think about the uh, organizations that you are familiar with. In fact, if I look around, I, everywhere I see process, whether it is in healthcare, whether it is in manufacturing, agriculture, logistics, everywhere you see that there are procedures, protocols, steps which are being taken, people working together, technology which is being used to produce all kinds of goods and services. So I'm always looking at organizations uh, as processes uh, where people, uh, people, technology uh, work together. Now, I think the fundamental insight, um, which is the basis of my lecture, is that these processes are not just there and given, and they shouldn't stay there as they are right now. Processes are something which you can manipulate, which you can engineer, which you can fine tune, which you can change. Uh, you can change steps, you can change how people work together, you can use different types of technologies. So you can take all kinds of measures to change the performance, the organization, and thus the performance of the process. So just like a product, which is mostly physical and which we can really imagine that we manipulate it, a process is also something that can be designed and can be redesigned and can be improved and even improved over many iterations. So that idea that a process, even though we cannot really touch it, it's not really a tangible asset, it is something which we can improve and change upon. Now, why would organizations at all be or, uh, interested in redesigning, improving their processes? In fact, there are two good reasons, I think. There are two main categories of reasons. There's one rather, I would say, pessimistic one and a rather optimistic one. So let me start with the pessimistic one. Everything breaks eventually. So anything that you develop, anything that you design will deteriorate. Now, think about roads, but this is also true for organizations and organizational processes. I call it entropy. Um, I've seen as a consultant very often that processes which used to perform very well deteriorate in performance over time because all kinds of mistakes happen within the process such that managers try to improve upon it with imposing all kinds of additional conditions and checks, which means that the process becomes slower and slower because all these additional checks have to be done all the time. Also, many processes rely on the use of information technology. And of course, information technology also has a limited I would say lifespan over time uh, when there is more data or when there are higher demands on information exchange, IT systems become outdated. So if you wait long enough, your process will start underperforming, especially when you start comparing it with competitors who have developed their processes more recently or have updated their processes more recently. So that is a negative incentive for organizations to once in a while reconsider the things they are doing and trying to improve their performance. So that's one reason. There was a beautiful case study. I will, it's also associated with a video clip. I won't show the video clip right here, but once I made my slide set available, you can check that for yourself. There's a beautiful video clip about a process which still takes place in the United States, which is concerned with the retirement of federal uh, employees. And um, you, you can hardly believe it, it's the 21st century, but people are still manually checking files, registering files, sending letters to make this process work. And this is a process which concerns tens of thousands of American citizens. And um, even though they try to improve upon it, 
the video clip will show you how difficult this really is. I'm, sh I'm telling you about this clip that you don't just think that bad, badly performing processes are something which is happening perhaps in organizations which are not very IT savvy or which are perhaps not very modern. This is taking place everywhere. In any organizations, you will see that sooner or later, processes start to underperform. So let's also focus on the more uh, positive um, motivation for organizations to look at process improvement and process design. Because the positive side is that if you know, if you can think of uh, good ideas, uh, smart innovations, proper use of new technology, you can actually gain an advantage over your competitors. If your process works faster, or if your process gives better customer satisfaction, or it's perhaps more transparent for the authorities who want to need to monitor your process, you can have an edge over your competitor. And that is that's a positive motivation to look at process uh, improvement. So there's also some data to back up the idea that organizations are really, or should actually be really be curious and interested in innovating their processes. So what I'm showing you here is a, a model which has been developed by two economists, Abernathy and Utterback, um, hence the name of this model. Uh, what these economists have done, they have studied a range of organizations and they have looked through to the life cycles that these organizations went through. And for most organizations, you can actually identify two of these life cycles. There is this right, sorry, this red wave, when you see that organizations will rely for quite some time on innovating their products to stay competitive and to keep a market share. So think of the iPhone, right? When the iPhone was released, the next editions of these iPhones were, were huge additional, uh, offered huge addition, additional features and were attractive products in their own. So Apple could rely on this product innovation to keep people interested in their phones. I'm not an Apple fan myself, but I know that even from Apple fans, um, that the differences between the new iPhones are not as impressive anymore as between the, the former uh, editions. But what you will see is that organizations, after a time of product innovation, they will move, they will move to not so much improving the products, but improving the processes which are associated with the generation and the distribution of their products. So it's not a, um, let's say, it's not a mystery why Apple, for example, is at this time interested in uh, generating its own currency. So this is, this is a process, a supplementary process, which makes it much easier to sell their products to their customers instead of innovating their products by themselves. And you can actually see that some organizations have mastered this uh, idea of innovating the processes around their products rather than innovating their, uh, their products themselves, become very good at it and also become very successful at it. I think the best example nowadays is Amazon. Uh, Amazon was, most people will not or, uh, realize that this is once something which was very in innovative. Amazon was the first organization that ordered on the web uh, one-click ordering that you could, with one push on the button, order uh, your products. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, they started um, uh, drone, uh, with their drone delivery of their products. The products did not change, but the delivery process, the, let's say, the uh, convenience for their customers is something that they really try to improve upon. And nowadays you have in the United States physical shops again, Amazon shops, where you walk in, you put the things that you would like to, you put it in your basket and you walk out without paying because you are being scammed when you leave the door, uh, which is again, additional convenience. So this is a good example of how an organization can move from product innovation to process innovation and stay, uh, and stay and stays competitive uh, as a result of this. So this is the positive thing. Organizations through process innovation can stay attractive for their customers or become even more uh, attractive. Now, the following question becomes relevant. If you have an existing process and you are convinced, I have convinced you that it is indeed a good idea to improve your process, right? Then, then the question will be, what do I need to do to move from the existing process 
to an improved version of that process. How do I make that? How do I make that step? Now, one of my favorite quotes of business books I've ever read, I'm going to show that to you. This is written by Sharp and McDermott. They have written a fantastic book about BPM. And on the basis of their experience as consultants, they say the following, how to get from the as is process to the to be process, and when you are redesigning, a pro uh, redesigning that process, is never explained. So we conclude that during the break, the famous ATMO procedure is invoked and then a miracle occurs. So when you ask people, how are you going to improve a particular process? They cannot really, often not really explain how they did it. They can explain to you what the end result is. They put people together in a room, perhaps. Somebody had a bright idea, but there is not a real systematic procedure which underlies uh, this approach, at least when we're talking about practice. And for many years, this has been a real challenge and a real problem. But what I think is that our discipline, the discipline of business process management, which is part of the information systems discipline, is getting better and better at developing and proposing methods that really can help organizations to do this in a methodological way. And the question may be, why is that so important that you do it methodologically? Well, if you do this, then you have a certain guarantee that um, you will not forget any options. You will uh, um, explore all the different options, but you will also um, be less dependent on the specific people that are involved in the redesign project because the method will guide you through it. Okay, so then what are these methods, right? Um, where can I find them? What, what, what are they really about? The main part of my lecture will be to give you a bit of an idea of all these different redesign methods which exist. I cannot hope to really explain any of them in, in very much detail. But I hope by giving you this overview that you will appreciate that there is that there are options to choose from. So even if you are already familiar with a particular redesign approach, I think it will be interesting to see that there are different options to move from the as-is process to a to-be uh, process in, in real life. And, and this is what I want to do, I want to do next. And I'm going to use um, this vehicle for it. I call it the redesign uh, orbit. Um, I will explain it uh, to you. Um, it is a way for me to give you an overview of all these different methods which, uh, which exist. Um, maybe this is a good time uh, to make a short break um, in case people have questions. Mahendra, you are still unmuted. <laughs> Sorry, there's one in the chat room. There yes. are three kinds of uh, Cahya Ningtia Sekar Wahyuni ask, there are three kinds of process performance measure, which are better, cheaper, and faster. Better is related to quality. And I will skip that. The problem is something we cannot achieve the three of them, maybe sometimes. For example, the faster and better performance, usually not the cheapest one, or the better performance, usually not the fastest. How do we have to deal with that condition? Can all those three measures be achieved together or which one do we have to prioritize? Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that question. We will address this question in, in more detail in a couple of minutes, but I, I like to give uh, an, an, an answer to it already, at least a preliminary answer. So I don't believe in redesign that can optimize all dimensions at the same time. I think people who say that they can make things faster, better, cheaper, etc. those people are politicians, right? They, they are ministers of, of countries and they say, we will make the healthcare system faster, cheaper, etc. Engineers, and I consider myself as an engineer, will always realize that there is a sort of a priority that you, that you need to use, that you can focus on one thing to make it better, but that you have to accept that other performance criteria will be affected and sometimes negatively affected. So in my view, redesign is a sort of a balancing act. Um, what you prioritize, which performance dimension you prioritize at one point may be very different than what you um, prioritize at another moment. So in that sense, redesign is also not final. You optimize a process to address 
the main concerns of an organization at that very at that very moment. If you lose customers to another organization which is faster, you can choose, of course, to compete with them on speed. Uh, but you can also say, okay, let them be faster, and I will deliver better quality. But to say we're going to be faster and we're going to deliver more uh, better quality is very tough. So in that sense, and it's a bit of a philosophical stance, I think I don't believe in that um, uh, um, mutual um, uh, mutual performance improvement. Okay. Um, can I ask if Ibu Cahya Ning or Mbak Cahya Ning, uh, do you want to add some more? Are you satisfied? Sorry. Okay, thank you for the explanation. Enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Andika, would you like to ask your questions directly, please? Uh, okay, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, Professor Rogers. Uh, I would like to ask a question. At which point? At which point a process can be categorized as outdated? are obsolete. For example, should an organization consider redesigning a process before the performance deteriorate if the competitors have outperformed the organization? Thank you for that uh, question. I think that most organizations would be wise to start acting before they start underperforming, of course. That is, that is I'd say, the preferred uh, approach by organizations, but I must also be uh, acknowledged that improving processes is uh, something which takes organizations an effort, right? Organizations can often only spend that much energy on analyzing and improving their processes. So what I see is that many organizations struggle with is to make that decision where to devote their attention to. Um, it's rather that you have to manage your whole portfolio of different processes and make decisions where the priority is highest to improve things. So one thing I, I like to keep in mind, and I also recommend organizations, is to really focus on the strategic processes to be also proactive, right? For these uh, strategic processes, uh, take measures before your competitors take them. But for perhaps other processes, your secondary, tertiary processes, perhaps if it's not broken, don't touch it. Okay. So, Andika? Uh, okay, thank you for the answer. I'm satisfied. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, pa Pata, would you like to ask your question, please? Pata? Yes, ma'am, yes. thank you. You're welcome. Please ask your yeah. question. I think it's a bit of a lag. And I'm afraid we couldn't hear you. Would you like to drop your questions over the chat? All right, if anybody else would like to ask a question, I think we can also have it during. Uh, yes. Yeah, would you like to carry on or take more questions? I will make a couple of more breaks. I will keep, make a couple of more breaks. So if people yeah. have a question, they will get their opportunity. Yeah. All right, okay. Okay, so let me continue. Um, what you're seeing here is the redesign orbit and it's a sort of a landscape. It's a way of organizing different uh, different uh, redesign methods. And I'm going to explain it to you um, using explaining the three dimensions of the redesign orbit, and then it becomes, I hope, a little bit clearer. So the first dimension I want to discuss is the ambition um, uh, dimension. Hello, sorry. What do I mean by the uh, ambition dimension is that you have different types of methods. You have methods, redesign methods, which are very transactional in nature. And you have methods which are transformational in nature. 
And these are really opposed to each other. You can also recognize that when you read books or methods or, or books on methods on design or scientific papers, the transactional methods, they aim to seek problems and resolve them in a very incremental way, step by step. And they do not really challenge the underlying process structure. They try to tune, fine tune the existing process to deal with small problems, to reap low hanging fruit and make the process perform a little bit better. But then there are these transformational methods which really try to achieve breakthrough innovation. Um, they will question the fundamental assumptions behind the process. In the most extreme case, they will move the process completely from the table and start redesigning a process from scratch. So that's, that's a very big difference. And I think it's fair to say that when the idea of redesign emerged uh, during the early 1990s, the emphasis was very much on the transformational methods to really try to obliterate existing processes to come up with something new. But what, what you can see over time is that organizations have shied away from these transformational methods and become much more interested in the transactional methods. Does anybody have an idea why this shift took place? Why these transformational methods have become less popular than the transactional ones? Anybody? No. <laughs> yes, Kevin? Kefian, you can answer first. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, probably because uh, transformational method is too hard to do, probably. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. That is exactly the point. It is extremely difficult to come up with a entirely different design from a process which really works in practice. Um, so organizations have found out that this is an extremely risky approach uh, to change everything uh, in a process. There is, of course, an advantage. If, it, if you manage to do this, you can move from a very low-performing process to a very high-performing process. But the risk is so big. Uh, so that is, that is what, what, you are, what you are also implying. It is difficult to do so. So rather, organizations are doing these, these transactional approaches. I'm not saying that this is the best approach in all situations. If you have an organization which is really, you know, uh, suffering from the competition that you have and you can only incrementally change the things you've been doing, you may, may, may be out of business very soon and you have no other option than to go for a transformational method. So it may be strategically the right choice at some moments, but it's much more risky. Yeah. So that's the first, thank you. So that's the first uh, axis or first dimension. The second dimension uh, deals with the nature of the method uh, itself. So the nature of the method, that dimension, you can distinguish between methods which rely on creativity and analytical methods, analytical methods which are much more perhaps mathematical in nature. So I try to explain that. Analytical methods, they tend to have a very strong quantitative focus. Uh, they involve figures, often tools, technology, to make all kinds of calculations about the process and also automatically or semi-automatically derive new processes. Opposed to those approaches are the creative methods. And the creative methods uh, involve human creativity and ingenuity. And they mostly try to uh, profit from group dynamics, putting people together, having them work together, brainstorm, come up with joint ideas, criticize each other's ideas, in that sense, um, uh, creating uh, a new process. So these approaches are very different in nature. And of course, there are methods which try to mix, in, mix them, but I'm using them more or less to distinguish the nature of uh, different methods. So what you see, for example, is that analytical methods are very much appreciated in organizations which are um, um, in the engineering domain, in the manufacturing domain. In those organizations, people are used to use figures uh, to also create their products. There are many uh, people who have this quantitative background. They can follow these approaches and they appreciate the rational um, um, fundament uh, under these uh, methods. 
But you can also see organizations which are much more political in nature, um, where there's policy making, um, where there's a lot, of, a lot of less emphasis on the cold hard figures of uh, things. And there people will are much more triggered by seeing other people and relying on the expertise of people and also the ideas of people within the organization. So what you often see is that these creative methods by themselves generate much more support in those type of organizations and analytical methods. So that's the second dimension. The third dimension is more or less the perspective, the perspective that these methods use on the organization. And then again, you can distinguish two sides uh, on this perspective. You have the inward looking and outward looking perspective, and they are, I think, pretty straightforward. The inward looking methods, they consider the process from the perspective of the inward organization itself. So you would draw from the objectives within the organization, the performance management system, but also the resources which are available within the organization to come up with an improved version of, of a process. By contrast, outward looking methods, they take an outsider outsider's perspective. Um, and they are actually driven by external opportunities and developments outside the organization to turn back to the organization and to try and improve things from there. So to give you an idea on this, uh, there are methods which, for example, involve artists who are organizations to give their perspective on what is happening within these organizations, simply to break away from the traditional perspective that people within an organization already have. Sometimes a benchmarking method is used. Um, um, so how are people being hired, for example, by temp agencies? Is that something that bureaucratic, more bureaucratic organizations can learn from? And that's also a way of taking the, an outward perspective as a starting point for redesign. And I would say that in general, most traditional redesign methods take this inward looking method. So that is more or less the default. But I think there's an increasing development um, that this outward perspective, outsiders which are involved in process redesign is gaining popularity. So this explains the dimensions behind the redesign uh, orbit. And when I, can, when I use that redesign orbit, I can use it to populate it with all types of methods that exist. And probably you will recognize a couple of them, it's like Six Sigma or um, uh, lean, which are very popular methods. Uh, I see those methods also, they are, they are bigger methods and involved with more things than just process redesign, but the process redesign components can also be categorized using this redesign orbit. Uh, what I'd like to do next is to give you a couple of examples of existing redesign methods, um, which I'm showing you here, and I will walk you through a couple of these. So you will get an understanding of how different they are from each other. And you perhaps also will develop an idea of when these different methods are more useful or more, uh, more applicable than others, um, depending on the situation that you want to apply them in. So there are four uh, methods which I like to uh, take, a look, uh, take a look at with you in a little bit more detail. I will walk them through uh, with you after the second one, I'll make a short break to take any questions uh, that you have by that point. Let me start with the, um, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. Uh, start with a method, which is called 7FE. I think the marketing of the method could be improved, but I was not involved in picking the name. It is a method which is described by um, Justin and Nilis, um, two very influential management consultants who've also written, I think, a very nice practitioner's handbook on how to do business process management in practice. So if you ever um, are going to do a project and you need a sort of a step-by-step -step guide on how to conduct uh, a process management project, I highly recommend this book because it's really hands-on and really gives you all kinds of uh, lists of things that you need to think of, very practical uh, advice. It can be, you can become a process consultant almost tomorrow when you uh, purchase that book. Um, and the overarching method that they describe, 7FE, is very similar to what most consultancy companies would also, I think, try to follow when they are starting 
uh, when they are doing a process redesign project. I've been a consultant myself with Deloitte and Accenture. And even though their methods are different in aspects, I think the philosophy behind these things is the, is the same. So perhaps to take a step back, the 7FE is a transactional method, which mostly relies on the creativity of people. So how does it work? Well, one of the main, the, uh, the core ingredients is that facilitators are running workshops with all kinds of, uh, of experts. So when you read the book, you will find all kinds of tips that the people who run these workshops, what they need to do to get ideas from people within the organization um, uh, to trigger um, um, ideas for improving processes. So these kind of moderators, they are often experienced consultants, they challenge people, uh, they ask for underlying uh, causes of problems, uh, they will try to come up with all kinds of questions, they will challenge people who are talking with each other where the biggest problems uh, are. And it's a very intuitive approach which relies on this group dynamics um, 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 culture. So you would have brown boards on the wall um, where people scribble down things, put tasks on there, uh, change the order of uh, tasks, and collectively you would come up with uh, a new uh, process approach. So this is, I'd say, the mainstream way of how processes are being redesigned in, in practice. So let me then try to mm, slightly um, uh, oppose or contrast that view with an approach that I'm also have been involved in myself, which is called heuristic process redesign. Compared to the 7FE, which I just explained, uh, it is a much more analytical method. So there's much less emphasis on the, on the group dynamics. There's much more effort on using a system, systematic method to come up with a new, uh, a new process. But it is still, we are still on the transactional side of the uh, spectrum. And we're also mostly at the inward looking, using an inward looking perspective. Heuristic process redesign is an approach where there is a fixed list of heuristics. Think of them as, as rules. There are almost 30 of them. And each of these rules stems from an earlier experience where this particular rule helped to improve the performance of a particular process. So what happens in a, in a project that runs the heuristic process redesign is that the list of all these heuristics that they are gone through and each of them is being evaluated whether it is an applicable measure in this specific situation at hand. And there may be different reasons why you wouldn't do something. For example, if you use a heuristic which helps to speed up the process, but it wasn't ever your plan to speed up the process, the quality of uh, the process should be improved, then perhaps that's not a very good rule to apply. Or if you see another rule, which perhaps seems attractive, but it has already been tried, it has already been done, you would also skip that. Nonetheless, when you go through this almost uh, this list of almost 30 redesign heuristics, it's very likely that you will find things which may be applicable and attractive to uh, apply in your situation. Perhaps it will even trigger other ideas, or perhaps you, it is, seems wise to combine different pro process redesign heuristics, right? So it's not a very rigid method that you have to perform only those heuristics, but it's a way to trigger a way of thinking about, about a new process design. So typically when you have gone through the list, you would cluster applicable methods together and generate new designs. So um, if you want to improve time, for example, and this is an example I'm showing you, you want to put tasks in parallel or you want to follow the principle of case-based work. What I will do now is I will give you a couple of examples of these underlying heuristics so you have a bit of an idea of what these heuristics are about. But before I can do that, I have to reflect a little bit on performance dimensions. So I was grateful also for the question on uh, speed and quality because uh, you indeed need to know which kind of things you really want to improve before you do any kind of uh, process improvement project. So this is more or less an intermezzo to reflect on typical performance dimensions that you may want to consider. You know, I'm not very orthodox in the sense that these are the most important ones uh, so if you are used of using three other dimensions, you mostly will see that they resemble each other. Um, but the list I am fond of is to think of time, quality, costs, and flexibility as 
important performance dimensions, which you may want to choose from and may which you want to improve, but of which you have to realize that there is a trade-off. So one of my colleagues in Utrecht many years ago proposed this kind of thinking model. And when I talk with my students, when I meet them uh, after they graduated and started working in industry after years, they often tell me that this is a model that they are still have in their mind and that they're still using almost on a day-to-day -day basis when they are thinking about improving things within their organization. The idea behind it is that if you have different dimensions like quality, cost, time, and flexibility, if, if you are improving something, you are pulling one of these dimensions to a higher level. But unfortunately, when you're pulling on one side, the other parts are moving along with it. So these things are in relation to each other. So the ordering of quality, time, flexibility, and cost is not so important in this figure. It's much more important that you see that they have something to do with each other. So for example, if you try to make a product uh, improve the quality of a process, perhaps you're going to introduce many checks in your process, which makes it much slower, right? Which makes the time performance dimension, which decreases it. So that is the idea behind it. Now, if you realize this, then let me show you an example of one of these 30 redesign heuristics. And that is the case assignment heuristic. So think that you are, think about yourself as a consultant, you are trying to improve the performance of a process, and one of the 30 rules, there are actually 29, I couldn't think of 30th one. So one of the 29 rules is case assignment. And the rule is let workers perform as many steps as possible when they carry out a single case. And so uh, there's a patient who comes into the hospital and preferably the contact person for that patient and the person who will do most of the tasks is all the time the same person. Uh, whether that is a nurse or a doctor, if the doctor or the nurse is capable of also doing the next possible step for the same patient, he or she will do that. Now, think about the performance dimensions. If you have this kind of approach, it will probably have a very big effect on the quality of the process. Why is that? Well, if you are being helped as a customer or the order is being processed by the same person for all these different steps, that person has a good understanding of the case of the patient or of the order and will use that information during all the steps he or she is involved in, which has an obvious effect on quality because uh, somebody will remember when he or she had contact with the client, what the client exactly wanted. He or she will remember what he or she has decided in a previous step. So all this information is implicitly carried on through the process, which has a huge quality effect. So that is why you see at the bottom of this page, the plus behind the quality sign, it has a very positive effect. Now, with respect to time, you can, on the one hand, you can imagine that if somebody is involved in many steps in the process for the same case, this may have a positive effect on time uh, because somebody doesn't have to read the whole document or the whole order or everything that is associated with the case to do the next step. Right? This is when you transfer work between people, there's often time involved in, in this transfer and this time is cut away, which is, which is good. On the other hand, if you want to rely on the same person for carrying out these different tasks, you of course have to rely on the availability of the person. So if uh, somebody takes a lunch break uh, and it is him or her who has to carry out the next step, the process has to wait, right? Because you prefer the next person. It's becoming worse if somebody's going on a holiday or is ill because then the pro process for this order or this patient, let's hope it's not a patient, uh, comes to a standstill. Yeah? So that is a negative effect on time. So that is why you see a plus and a minus for this dimension. The flexibility of the process definitely goes down because you will then you will all the time have to rely on the same person carrying out this, this process, at least in the most extreme form of this, uh, uh, of this uh, the application of this heuristic. So let's, let's try a little game now. Um, I'm going to explain to you a redesign heuristic, which you probably already know. Um, it's the outsourcing heuristic. So if you have a process or a workflow in place, you may want to consider that you take a part of that process and that you outsource it to a third party who can do that part for you. And you will pay uh, that third party for it. Uh, and the third party will carry out the steps that you used to do in that process and will deliver 
the outcome of that process back to you so you can go on with the process. So think about the performance dimensions, time, quality, flexibility, uh, which one did I forget? Cost, no? Time, cost, flexibility. Quality. Yes. So what is the, can anybody think of the performance dimension, which is probably very positive, can be positively influenced by taking this measure? Somebody, Dicky said quality and Akma. Yes, someone said, okay, would you like to answer? Please, Akma. Akma. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahedra and Professor Reyes for the time. Uh, so I think uh, the most affected uh, aspect will be time because uh, we, we can uh, we can take the necessary work that we have to do and give it to the outsourcer and outsource it. And we can make it more time efficient. So I definitely, think. I, I, think, I think you're if you're thinking in the right direction, right? If the party who takes over the process is specialized in this particular task, they have probably have built up expertise to this and can do this faster. Right? So this is, this is one positive, uh, positive effect of it, certainly. Can you also think of another positive effect, potentially? And I think uh, quality is also applicable in this case because, uh, as you said before, if the party is uh, specialized in this case, so yeah. they must be, have a very good quality regarding the product they are, uh, uh, they are doing. So that, that could be the case, right? I have seen, uh, and that is why, why it is also important to realize that we are talking about um, this impact in general, right? In specific situations may be different, but if the organization is has expertise, as I also assumed, then the quality could be higher. But it is also true that in organizations that try to outsource to gain cost benefits, that the quality may actually drop uh, that you outsource, for example, a software development project to um, a team where there are lower, lower uh, labor costs, then you really have to struggle to keep the quality, perhaps, of the delivered software up to a certain level. And this is what also many organizations experience. But I agree also with your point, depending on the party to which you outsource, quality may also be affected. So then we have not discussed one final performance dimension, Flexibility. Can anybody else give me their view on what is likely to happen with respect to the flexibility of the process? Evan, please. Uh, yeah, uh, prof, I would like to answer. Uh, I think the flexibility will be lower because if we outsource, uh, then it will be harder to communicate. So I think it will affect the flexibility to be lower. Thank you. Definitely. I fully agree with you. Um, when you hand over work and it is uh, then carried out by another party, there are of course less opportunities to still interact and communicate with such a party when the process is really being carried out. So if the customer calls you and says, hey, oh, I, I really like to have a different color of the product that I just ordered, or, or um, can you make two similar, uh, similar ones? It is of course much more difficult to then manage the process, update the process on, at runtime and change your or the order or the production process when there's a third party carrying out this part of the process. So your flexibility will go down. Whether this is important or not, that depends on the kind of organization you are and how you want to compete with other, uh, uh, other organizations. But it is very likely that your flexibility will go down because of this. So thank you for your, uh, for your kind answer. So that I'd like to move on. So there's a whole list of these heuristics. Uh, I already um, indicated this, so you can see a blank space there. There's not, there are 29, there are not uh, 30 of them. But I would suggest if you really are involved in a process redesign project, to at least take a brief look at these heuristics to see what they are about and to see if they can help you to generate new ideas for, uh, for your process improvement project. 
they are also described in the fundamentals of the BPM uh, uh, handbook uh, in an appendix. There's also a lot of scientific work behind it in the sense that we looked at the validation of these heuristics. Many, or, uh, many scientists at the moment are also trying to automate these kind of uh, heuristics. So if you have a process description in any form, whether you can perhaps automatically identify opportunities uh, for the application of these redesign heuristics and perhaps generate new designs automatically. I think it's a very uh, exciting uh, field of research, but also in practice, people have been using uh, them and sometimes they are being mixed. So do you remember that I told you about the seven FE approach, which is much more about how you having workshops and groups. You can of course mix the things you can have people, you can put people uh, together and then have them collectively look at these redesign heuristics, right? So it's not black and white purely uh, between these uh, methods. Okay, so um, I'd like to again make a very short stop uh, for questions before I move on to the last two examples that I want to give. Yeah, and for timing, we have two questions already. Yeah. So um, I'm not gonna, um, let me just read it because it's from Pata earlier. Yes. And he said, in my experience, 94% organization could not improve their processes, sequence and interaction, and becoming toxic organization due to top management did not well understand about BPM or process approach and always see organizations by organizational chart. Why the most management did not well understand about this? And please share your study in, the, in your country. So if I understand the question properly, um, it is about that real life um, process redesign projects fail because they are not really supported by top management, uh, which I think, means- I think much more than that. It's like the, not just the process redesign, but BPM as a whole. As a whole. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> To be honest, this is a mystery to me also. Why um, are some managers less enthusiastic about this uh, approach? I think the main reason is that it is, it goes back to one of the first pictures I've shown you. The way we train people in business schools, at university and colleges is very oriented towards the functions within an organization. So for example, when you go to university, you can still study marketing. And when you study marketing, you see things from a marketing perspective, or you do an accounting study where you use a where you develop a financial perspective on organizations. What you often see is that managers and also top managers have made a career uh, by by taking by using this particular perspective of an organization. So, CFO of an organization has a financial objective um, um, and looks at an organization as a as a money-making machine very often. So when you then talk about something which is really trying to align the interests of many different departments and different groups, there are often very few supporters of this type of approach because it, it requires people to really think beyond the borders of their own limited responsibilities, right? It requires people to see the merit of streamlining things across different perspectives within an organization. And that is something which is not very natural to many organizations, but I um, um, relate that to the way people have often been trained and have been often been, uh, have gotten used to looking at organizations. So I think it is very often uh, also a, uh, a matter of education. And what I think always works or often works is that you can show the benefits of using a process-centered approach. And there is enough literature, there are enough cases, there are very convincing studies which show that organizations who work in a more process-centered uh, way, in a pro more process-oriented way, outperform organ the similar organizations who do not do that, uh, both financially, which interests many managers, but also it creates much less conflicts for people uh, within an organization when there is a sort of a process concern instead of only the focus on individual functional units. So that's my perspective. Um, and about how uh, it works in the Netherlands, maybe just a few? Because so I think in the Netherlands, we, we struggle as, 
as many other countries do, where we, so it's not that the Netherlands is, um, everybody is, is looking at organization in a process-centered way. But I do think that um, uh, it, is, it is gaining momentum that organizations, uh, many of these organizations start seeing the benefits. So one of the uh, biggest um, or, uh, Dutch organizations is Dutch British, uh, is uh, for example, Shell. When you look at the website of Shell, and if you, when you take a look at how Shell presents itself, it doesn't present itself through this functional structure. It shows all the main processes which are happening within the organization, which shows that the first thing that they want to show is that they have these, these, these main processes uh, generating energy from natural so uh, resources, uh, exploration of uh, new energy sources. These are all processes which you can immediately see when you check out what the shell is really doing. And I think that's a sort of a reflection of that organizations are, some of these organizations at least, are embracing this perspective. But it's, it's definitely not, not everywhere. I mean, uh, we have a moment in announce, we have a, quite a scandal with our tech service um, where the procedures were implemented and, and executed much too rigorously. And I think that this as actually shows a lack of process orientation. Thank you. Okay, can you take another two questions because there are two questions? Yeah, sure, go yeah. ahead. So you just mentioned, uh, this is from Edward. He asked, you just mentioned transformational methods has a big risk and it has been indeed experienced by a company called Procter & Gamble because at 2012, they failed at aiming to be the most digitalized consumer goods company. It is said that the reason of their failure is because their scope of transformation is not small enough. So yeah. my question is how small of a scope should an organization try to change their process? Thank you. Thank you for that uh, question. Um, so I don't have the ultimate answer, but I can at least help you a little bit thinking about the uh, about how to determine the scope for um, a redesign project. So scope and impacts are related to each other. The bigger you take your scope of the process or the processes that you that you will um, consider for redesign, potentially the bigger the impact is. Right? If you're going to improve the steps taken within a single, a single department, the impact will be much less than when you look, um, look for, for example, standardizing um, uh, a sort of a, an invoice process over all the units of your multinational organization right, in every country. So th when the scope is bigger, the impact is going to be, potentially is going to be higher. Um, and what is the, the trick is, of course, is to find a sort of a balance that the project, as the scope becomes bigger, it becomes more difficult to manage, but the impact is higher. So what you need to do is to find a sort of a balance of a scope that is still manageable, but where the impact is in accordance with, I'd say, uh, the desired performance improvement. So again, if you are struggling as an organization and uh, you need to make a big step, then I would recommend to take, make the scope of your redesign project bigger because you really have to achieve um, uh, a big a leap in performance. But if you have a very complex organization and you are at the top of your game and you want to try out a new technology, uh, then perhaps use a small scope to first see the benefits of this technology before you start rolling it out to all the different units or branches that you have of that, uh, uh, of that particular process within your, your organization. So it's not a, an answer, a clear cut answer in the sense that the scope has to be this big, but you have to balance the scope with the impact that you want to uh, achieve because that determines, I think, the, the kind of manageability that you are willing to accept. Okay, so Edward, is that okay? It's okay, I'm satisfied. Thank you, Professor Agers. You're welcome. And another one is from Alexander Nicholas. Uh, the 7FE method is more into transactional, creative, and inward looking. I understand that we have to ask lots of questions to trigger ideas because it implements the creative method where it relies on human creativity and 
it's just a difficult word, <laughs> ingenuity. <laughs> but on the slides, there's a point that says, must look for the second right answer. Can you please explain why do we need the second answer if we already have an answer to a certain issue? Ah, okay. Thank you for that uh, question. So what is, uh, I think the, the, the reason that uh, Justin and Nilus put that there is that their experience, and I think I can confirm that, is that when people talk about issues or, or problems within organizations, they often focus on the surface of the problem. They see the problem <clears throat> and they often try to fix the service problem. But very often there is an underlying problem which causes these different symptoms. So it's just like a doctor who can try to, for example, uh, treat your skin uh, if, you have a, if you have a rash or a, a sort of a wound. But if there is an underlying problem within your body that generates this, then perhaps this superficial treatment won't, won't really work. So there are very good cases uh, which are being described. I'm now thinking of um, a redesign project that, was, that is described by Michael Hammer, where people um, are so dissatisfied with finding, the, finding out where a particular order in the process is, and everybody's calling each other, right? why, where is this order, that they try to introduce a communication desk which tried to monitor <laughs> where the order was at any time. But this was not the real problem. The real problem was that the process was really too slow and people became anxious about whether it would finish in time. So by focusing on the symptoms and by focusing perhaps on the first answer, you don't really get to the root of the problem. I think that is the uh, thinking behind it. Okay. Um, right. Uh, there's a question from the YouTube channel. <laughs> So Ricardo Garces asked, how is BPM appropriate to robotic process automation, RPA? He's got two questions. What can you tell employers when they want to improve projects, but mainly hire employees who focus on Six Sigma approach? Ah. So, well, uh, maybe RPA first and then so how much time do I have? Because uh, <laughs> RPA is, 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 a, is, a, is a pet wow. topic of mine. Um, so it could, it, it could lead to a whole new lecture. So I'm very enthusiastic about this uh, technology. What I think, very short answer then, but there's much more to say about it. Uh, RPA is a technology which really helps to uh, automate simple tasks by people. So um, and there's a big connection between RPA and, and process management. So where RPA perhaps focuses much more on the tasks that individual people do most of the time, process management is much more about the coordination of all the tasks that different people perform. And so RPA has a smaller scope, but they work very well in, um, uh, in coordination with each other. So increasingly, I see that organizations are applying RPA and trying to, if they do it well, uh, integrate that into process management initiatives. So that's, that's my view on, on RPA. Um, so the question with relate to, relates to Six Sigma. So there are many enthusiasts about Six Sigma and I don't want to take anything away from the attractiveness of Six Sigma. The problem I have with people who are so fond of Six Sigma is that they treat it as a hammer that they can, that they can use to hit anything at, right? Not just nails. Um, Six Sigma is a very nice approach if quality is the issue in your organization and you want to improve the quality of your, of your product. But if it's not about quality, then Six Sigma is, in my uh, opinion, not the right method. The good thing is that people who are already trained in Six Sigma have at least a sort of an understanding how a method, an analytical method, can help an organization to achieve particular goals. But it really has to fit with the objectives of organizations, how they want to improve, uh, whether this is, this is really an appropriate uh, approach. I don't think if you want to become more flexible, that Six Sigma is the way to go, right? So there are two sides to it. It's good that people are already enthusiastic about using a method, but the method in itself is limited with respect to the things that you can, do, can achieve. Right, I think... Um... Since this is from the YouTube channel, I think um, hopefully that he uh, heard and can 
be happy with the, your answer. So um, at the moment, there's no more questions. So if you would like to finish off or carry yeah, on. I'd like to uh, continue. So what do you think, Mahendra? Do we need a, a bigger break or shall we continue? I'm still fresh. But... Yeah, I think so. I mean, we can always put the more question and answer after you finish all your materials. I'll continue. I'll continue. Let me, let me try to wrap up. There are two things I still want to do. I want to finish my explanation of the different methods. And then I would like to move to the, uh, the end part of this presentation, where I will also give you sort of an additional views on process improvement. Which right, we you can, can do that by maybe another 20 minutes, so we can have more questions later. Yes, okay, good. So I'm going to talk about the NEST. And the NEST is a method which is rather new, and it's developed uh, uh, at Queensland University of Technology by, uh, I think, one of the most fantastic BPM professors uh, working in the field, Michael Roseman. Um, and it is an approach which is, I go back a little bit, which is situated much more in the outward looking sphere, and, but still uh, a creative method like the uh, 7FE. So um, what, is, what is being done is that people are put together in a physical room. And the room, and I've seen it, and there are video clips uh, of this on, on, on YouTube, uh, the room has a particular meaning for the redesign project. So you see a sort of an overview of that room, a top-down overview of that room at the bottom of this, uh, this slide. So when you start redesigning, the people are sitting in the now side of the room. So they are there physically, all of them, and they study a process as it exists. Uh, they study how the customer goes through that process. And what they see when they look through the room, they see on one wall, they see the resources, all the things that are available to them, the specialists within the organization, but also the technologies that exist, sometimes new technologies like RPA, which perhaps is not applied at all. So they see all kinds of things that they could potentially use on, on the, uh, one wall. And on the other wall, they see the guidelines of the organizations, which are really important to respect. Uh, they, cannot, they cannot move beyond these guidelines because they're important. For example, uh, they want to be certified by a third party, and then there are certain rules that they have to take into account. So what they do is, in, in, in different sessions, they gradually move through that room to arrive at the room at the other side of the room, uh, the wall at the other side of the room, where the future is going to be drawn. And interestingly, the future is drawn in three different ways. So people are, during, when they follow this approach, they are thinking on three different levels. They're thinking on the level of what to change, what can I change in the process right now so that it will perform better in 20 days? What are the things I would be able to do if I have 20 months to improve this process? And what, what could I do if I have a couple of years? So they are continuously thinking about these three levels of changing the process using the resources which are available and the policies that they have to stay with it. And what happens is that uh, once in a while, outside experts are being invited to give a presentation in the room, to tell about a new technology, or perhaps to tell about the different industry uh, where process, uh, process improvements have been done. So to inspire uh, people. And it's a very, I would say, a very creative approach. It also fosters this, this group uh, dynamics but it really tries to draw, draw in insights from the outside world to inspire people to really move to that um, um, other side of the room. And in that way, also end up with a couple of redesigns. There's a very nice clip. Again, in my presentation, there's a link to this uh, clip where you can see Michael Roseman explain how his method is being applied also by his own university, by QUT, to improve uh, their own processes. <clears throat> and I always like this, right? When something is being developed and it's also being used at this particular site, it's eat your own dog food. Uh, so that is, I think, a good sign for, for any method. So have a look, I really recommend it. So now let me uh, very briefly, this is, uh, this is a bonus, uh, show you another method in the same uh, quadrant or sphere, the process model, model canvas, so people may be familiar with the business model canvas to generate new business models. Uh, organizations are now at different places in the world are also trying to develop these canvases for 
uh, process model design. I'm just showing it you as a, as a gimmick, but I think this will also gain some traction. But what I want to move to is the final uh, method, the method of product-based design, because I think it's a very good example of an outward looking method, which is still analytical in nature. So it nicely contrasts with the nest uh, approach, which I just uh, discussed. So product-based design is an approach which is using a sort of, a, I think, um, intuitive idea about how we arrive at the design of a business process. So if you see this, this schematic overview of a business process, which I'm, which I'm showing you right now, the question may be, how did I end up developing a process like this where I'm combining two blocks and then putting them on something else? Thank you. Um, so the answer to that question is that you probably have a conception of the final product that you want to deliver. If you have a conception of a particular product, then you can reason back to the steps that you have to take to create that product. And so that is the intuition behind this idea. And if you develop this idea further, uh, then you come to an approach which does the following. So assume that you have in an organization already a proper description of your product that you really want to deliver. And that is written down, that is specified by product managers. And they have a sort of an, a view, for example, of a financial product. I've applied this method in a, within a bank. So they know for a loan, uh, what the exact regulations are, what the properties are. A marketeer has already thought of how to introduce it to clients. Um, uh, others from a financial department will have determined how this product can be profitable. So they have, they have this kind of understanding of what the product could really be. What you could do with an information systems perspective is to disentangle all these specifications to all the different pieces of information that you would need to produce this product. So that is something that you can see in the middle uh, of this slide. You can create a product data model, for example. I applied this method in a social security agency, which had to decide uh, on whether to give people unemployment benefits or not when they became unemployed. So in the end, they have to make a decision whether somebody gets these benefits or not. So that's a piece of information they have to determine. But to create that piece of information, they have to make other decisions. They have to, for example, to determine whether somebody has been working in the past five years. So a rule in the analysis is that you cannot get unemployment benefits unless you have worked for four out of five years in the, in the past five years. So that's a sort of a sub-decision that you have to take. But to make this sub-decision, you have to yet take another sub-decision. What does it mean that somebody has worked within a year? Is that that somebody has worked one day or is there sort of a minimum of days that somebody has worked, etc.? So especially for products which are informational in nature, you can unravel the information that you actually want to deliver as the outcome of the process. You can unravel it in smaller pieces of, of information and create a model. So you are translating the product specification into this product data model. And if you have that product data model, you can generate a process because a way to go through that product data model is actually uh, a process. The people among you who have perhaps experience in uh, the manufacturing domain may recognize this, this approach because in manufacturing it's very common that for a particular product there was a bill of material which shows all the different components that a physical product is, is composed of. And if you have this bill of material which shows lists all these components, then you can also reason back to different processes which can create that product. So a very small example, if you have a bill of material and it shows that a car is, is composed of a chassis and four wheels and an engine, then you know that these components have to be put together in some way, right? And it's very difficult to put the wheels to the engine. So you probably have to put the wheels to the chassis first, or perhaps first put the engine in the chassis before you can assemble the wheels. So in this way, by understanding the product, you can develop a process and you can probably develop different variants of a process. So this is an approach which is clearly analytical, but it's also an outward looking approach. Why? Because you're using the expertise of 
people who have make a description of the product that they want to deliver, right? And only then use it to develop an internal process. What the existing process is at this moment is not important, right? You derive the process completely from the product. Now, this is an approach I, I used to work with uh, Deloitte when we developed uh, this approach. We also applied it in industry in many, uh, many settings. And has, uh, if you want to read more about it, there's a lot of uh, papers uh, in, this, uh, in this area. So question to you. There was one sphere of this redesigned orbit, which I didn't fill. Have a look at the orbit and look at this area. And is there anybody who can explain to me why this area is empty? Was it because I was lazy or is there another reason? I think it's a hard question. No one answered. Oh. I'll help you. Oh, there is a response. Yes, from Yoga Nara. Yoga, would you like to answer directly? Uh, thank you for the chance to give to me. Well, I think from the internal perspective, maybe people inside the organization are are busy doing their daily tasks, maybe so they they are hard to think creatively, maybe or I think yeah. I think that's well, my yeah, opinion. Because people working in the organization, they have they're busy and they do you think it's easy for them to to develop an I ideas of completely doing their work completely in a completely different way? Is that easy for them or is that difficult? I think it's very difficult. Uh, unless, unless the the organization has a certain certain structure that focusing on the research and focusing on the development, yes, and yeah, because yeah. I think that's my opinion. I like it. Thank you very much for sharing it. Uh, I think this is true. I think it's very difficult to reason from the internal perspective only and come up with really groundbreaking transformations. It's incredibly, incredibly difficult to rely on people who are involved in the day-to-day -day operations of their processes to, to really imagine how they could do that work entirely differently. So the, the flip side of this is that also, this also means that if you want to achieve a transformation of your process, it's probably a good idea to bring in external expertise, right? To bring in expertise, to bring in at least the outside perspective. How are others doing this? Or bring in knowledge about new technologies, technologies which are not used to, or perhaps have somebody fresh looking at the performance of your processes. And so one of the things that I always enjoyed is asking people why they do things they do. And the answer is often, well, this, this, this was the way it was being done when I started here, right? This is how they explained it to, to me. But that is not, of course, necessarily the best way to carry out this process. I also think that many people have good ideas on how to improve the way they are working, right? So I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that people do not see improvement opportunities. What, I say, what I'm saying is that it is very difficult to, for people to really come up with entirely new, new ways to do their work. Uh, rather than making incremental improvements. So in, I think that is a good reason for why this sphere, why this part of the redesign orbit is empty. There's so one comment in the chat uh, from Pak Firman who says that creative transformational can use suggestion system in Kaizen. What do you think about it? Certainly, yes. I, th I also agree, but I think that Kaizen is also um, driven by an external, also by external perspectives, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll move on. So I'm going to, moving towards the completion of my, uh, of my lecture, um, because I've painted the picture of all beautiful redesign methods and uh, it looks very rosy. Uh, if there are so many methods, how can a redesign project ever fail? Um, and this is not the whole story, of course. Redesign projects also go wrong. And 
we had a discussion already during some of the questions about uh, failures uh, of redesign. And I want to devote a little bit of attention to that. So um, there are, unfortunately, there's a bias in our scientific literature. Uh, in the scientific literature, there's much more emphasis on success stories. So when you start reading about redesign methods, you will often see a redesign method being explained and also being illustrated using a successful case, right? It's, it would be a very weird scientific paper that says, hey, we have a new method and it failed here, right? So there are often, there are often success stories. And I also have this feeling when I look at these American management books that it's success after success after success. But clearly, uh, things don't always go right. So one of the papers that I, I really am fond of, have been fond of reading, and it's an old paper, is this paper, which is called IT Enabled Organizational Transformation, a Case Study of PPR Failure. And in my opinion, we should much more focus also on, on publishing these kind of failed case studies because they will actually give us hints on what we need to do better and how to improve our methods. So in this particular situation, um, the authors identified a number of problems uh, that I think are very common in redesign projects. So the problems that caused this redesign project to fail were difficulty in creating an atmosphere or open communication between everybody's involved. So very often redesign projects are something which are decided upon from a top-down uh, approach where employees are not really in the know of what is happening, what the objectives are. Uh, they become fearful of their own jobs. Um, and so management fails to communicate these goals. And then you see that these things get, uh, get stuck. Um, sometimes the, uh, you also see uh, pressures against selecting IT vendors on merit. Um, so for a common joke that consultants make is that IT decisions are often made on the golf court where a CEO hears about from another CEO which technology, which system they have bought and then thinks, oh, then, then we should buy that too. And whether that system is really applicable and is really worthwhile to invest in is perhaps another, uh, an entirely other question. So... Um, uh, alignment with other kinds of strategies, uh, the HR and IT strategy, discontinuities in leadership. I've often seen this, that a redesign project has started. And when there was a new manager, he or she immediately stops the initiative because he or she was not the one behind it, right? So this discontinuity will also lead to all kinds of, uh, of problems. So I'm showing you this to also appreciate make you appreciate that these things are difficult. It's not just about sitting behind a desk and drawing a new model. Uh, there's much more to it when you really want to um, improve organizational performance through process redesign. Um, one of the management gurus, the late Michael Hammer, uh, he was not only a very good writer, but also a very funny writer. So he also came up with these lists of the feel factors of redesign. Uh, so I'd like to draw your attention to the 10th one, ignore the concerns of your people. That's a, certainly a fail factor. But number seven is also nice, re-engineer slowly. You have to keep up the speed, otherwise you lose momentum and you lose the interest of uh, people. So there's also already some knowledge that we acquire on how to do this uh, better. So when you are developing your skills as a BPM professional, as a student of uh, BPM, look at the methods, look at the techniques, but also appreciate that there is much more to it than applying a method properly. Yeah? There's also a sort of a, um, a bigger uh, organizational concerns that you have to address when you want to become successful. There is a very nice video clip on YouTube. I included the link again, uh, which deals with the change management perspective of process management. I haven't said anything about that really today, uh, but of course there is a topic which is really of importance to BPM consultants. Um, the person behind this video clip, the process doctor has a range of interesting uh, video clips. They are all very much uh, um, fun to see. And I think there's also a lot of knowledge hidden in these clips. So I also warmly recommend them. Now, final consideration. Um, in this lecture, I've been talking with you about performance, right? We talked about quality, speed, flexibility, etc. One thing that I want to emphasize is that as a 
potential future process designer, you also have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to the world, I think, not only to think about the hard performance criteria that you try to improve upon. Uh, there are also other concerns, and I want to give you an example of how a small decision in a process, which may generate more income or which may speed up the process, may also have very adverse effects. And this is a case which is rather recent, which deals with uh, how Uber operated its taxi services in Brazil. So in Sao Paulo in 2016, Uber changed the procedure of paying for rides. So until that time, Uber uh, only took on uh, passengers in Uber rides when they could pay with a credit card. And obviously in Brazil, uh, not everybody has a credit card, nobody in the, nowhere in the world, but there are many people uh, who would prefer to pay cash. So Uber considered that this would generate, of course, much more revenues to change this and to allow customers to pay with cash which also meant that criminals became aware of that these Uber rides uh, and these Uber chauffeurs had cash with them when they would be picked up. So immediately when this measure was taken, crime against Uber drivers rose tenfold. Um, fake calls for these uh, taxis were... Hey. Hello? Fake calls were being made and uh, these um, uh, Uber drivers were being, uh, being robbed. So this makes you, uh, perhaps this is a good example of showing that a small element in a business process, and this is just uh, the payment part of a bigger procedure on how to do this, may have a big effect. And I think we also have a responsibility as engineers, as designers, information systems professionals, also to consider the impact of these kind of decisions in other areas. All right. So by having said that, I come to my summary of the lecture. Uh, I try to convince you and show you that redesign is not easy, but very crucial for organization. It's not easy in the sense that the redesign projects may fail if they are not embedded in the right organizational change, if they're not properly communicated, if you don't align the objectives of different people, if it doesn't fit with the strategic goals of the organization. Yet again, it is crucial that organizations get interested in this and try to improve either their broken processes or generate new things that they can uh, use to become more performative and also more competitive. Um, the main message in my lecture was that there was a range of redesign methods. So it's great if you are already familiar with one or two but I think it would be, I, I would be really pleased if you remember from this lecture that there is a whole toolbox of things out there and that it makes sense to get to know these different tools, these different methods, and that you skillfully apply these methods in the right situation. So don't use lean everywhere because you just happen to know lean. Think about the methods and the fit with the, let's say the, 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 the the organizational characteristics and the objectives of the organization. Other than that, there was, it's also an interesting research field. So if you have a great idea of coming up with a new redesign method, uh, so think of the NEST approach, which I thought was totally cool, right? If you have an idea on how to do this, it may also be a good topic to uh, develop further research on, and I would be very interested to learn more about that. That's the end. That is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm also open to your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, now um, we can open for another uh, session, the final session for questions. If there are anybody who would like to ask more questions, you are more than welcome. You can raise your hands or also put the uh, your question in the chat. And okay, if Hasul Ham Amal, can you please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Buma Hendra, for the opportunities. And thank you, Mr. Reyers. I hope I spell your name right for the really great insight today. 
uh, my question is kind of regarding the context of the world we live in right now in the middle of the pandemic, right? So, you know, big companies and enterprise are kind of struggling right now, like big fashion companies and many manufacturer-oriented companies that outsource their product making in China currently struggling with COVID, right? My question is, uh, is this a proof or an example of a very flawed a method of process designing before, like how these companies didn't think of the possibility of a global pandemic before that will stop the world economy, or maybe uh, this pandemic is a, is one in a million accident that there will be no companies that actually going to be prepared regarding this uh, pandemic. Second question, you know, right now many companies are forced to change their process uh, business and starting to redesign their process, right? Uh, is there any specific approach or specific things that should be taken into consideration when redesigning process, especially to cope in within the pandemic that we face right now? Okay, so two questions. First question is why has no company considered this uh, pan pandemic and then what redesign would be uh, appropriate for this kind of case? Yeah. So let me let me try to to give you my perspective. Uh, I, few organizations have seen this coming, of course, but I think there's a pattern uh, a pattern that can be distinguished um, behind the problems that many organizations have dealing with the pandemic at the moment. I think that many organizations have become highly dependent on certain fixed cooperation structures. Right? They have made very efficient operations. They created very efficient collaborations between uh, organizations, but they lacked the flexibility to change these processes when uh, the pandemic, of course, uh, struck. So you see that organizations have overemphasized the efficiency on, on the efficiency dimension, uh, lacking sufficient flexibility to change things uh, when, when, this disaster, when this disaster struck. I think the disaster is so big that, of course, it was very difficult to anticipate exactly this. But I do think that many organizations now should consider why they do not have overemphasized the efficiency of their operations. For example, in the Netherlands, uh, we see that we lack capacity, um, hospital capacity to deal with the patients um, uh, that, that are, have become infected with COVID. If we just look just across the border, when we look at a country like Germany, and it's very difficult for me to give compliments to Germany, uh, to be honest. But when we look across the border, we see that Germany has invested much more in keeping up the capacity of their hospitals, also in the times that, that there were no of these, these disasters. So you can see that they, there are different decisions have been made with respect to capacity and also uh, flexibility. So I think that's the that's the most important insight that I think that organizations should also um, uh, wonder about whether they not become very vulnerable uh, as an expense in, in, in relation to the efficiency gains that they that they uh, achieve. And that that is my my insight. I think. So your your second uh, question um, is whether there is anything that that we can recommend organizations who now have to deal with, uh, with the pandemic uh, when they are going to design or redesign processes. So one of the things that I think is, is important is to think about the scalability and scalability is an aspect of flexibility. So whatever you do, I think it makes sense to really favor approaches which are easily scalable, right? If you think about, for example, Um, airlines who have now to deal with all these customers making inquiries about, you know, cancelled flights or compensation that they get, but also perhaps are hoping that pretty soon uh, flights will ha uh, happen again. They have to, I think they have to anticipate that the demand for services may go up very quickly and down again. So I would say that it makes sense to invest in technology, but also in procedures where you can more easily scale up things. And so not just focus on, again, on efficiency and on speed, but, but focus on flexibility. So one of the reasons that I am so fond of this devil's quadrangle with the four dimensions and not just uh, um, cost and uh, quality and time, but also flexibility is that I think this is a sort of a underappreciated uh, performance dimension and that 
a pandemic actually shows how important uh, this dimension is. Does that, does that help? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear. Thank you, Mr. Ryers. You're welcome. Okay, um, any other questions, please? Still have, all right, Andika again. Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think right now there are uh, one more performance measure that is trending, sort of trending right now. It is uh, sustainability because big companies uh, right now they think of the environmental impact of their processes and what yeah. do you think about that? What are your opinion about that? I think that sustainability is uh, indeed is uh, a very important consideration and I am very glad that many organizations are looking, uh, are considering this now as a performance dimension which is crucial to them. So a couple of years ago, I thought that many organizations mentioned this as being important but did not really follow up on this, but I can see more and more examples of organizations that also realize that it's not only something good to do for the world, but it also is attractive for a lot of their customers that they are dealing with companies which are ethical, which invest in uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable production process, etc. So I, I, I see that this is taking off and I, I, I'm really happy to, to see that. So you can argue about, you can always argue about whether this is a separate uh, uh, dimension uh, or, and, uh, for now, I, I, can, I see it as a specific kind of quality dimension. It's a sort of a quality of life, but also external qualities, quality of for the world, right? quality of the environment. So it's not only quality of the product and the internal process, but a wider conception of quality. But, you know, I don't really mind whether you would call it a separate dimension or subsumed on another dimension. What I think is much more important that it should be recognized as something uh, as a target for an organization to, to really focus on when they start improving, uh, improving their processes. Uh, okay, thank you for your answer. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, any others? I think, uh... At the moment, there's no question. So can I ask you a question? Of course. Right. So you mentioned about this product, uh, product-led design. I think that's the one thing that I find it really difficult if I have to have uh, if I have to explain it myself. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. And you said that there's been a lot of research on that, but also it very much depends on um, information-based. Uh, products. So um, do you think or do you see that this kind of um, approach can be used to other uh, type of product or services as well? Thank you. I think it is fair to say that this particular approach, pro approach of product-based design is limited to settings where there is a sort of a informational product or service uh, which is being delivered and that there is a sort of a prior conception of what the ultimate product should look like, right? In those cases, this method is applicable. And that is admittedly a much more narrow um, niche than, uh, for example, the, the nest approach, which could be applied for anything, uh, right. probably. So the, the applicability is much smaller. But what, what is interesting, I think, is that the, the idea behind product-based design is an idea that comes from the manufacturing domain. And in manufacturing, this is quite a popular approach. So there was a, uh, a Dutch company, uh, a truck uh, company, Duff, and they have bills of materials which consist of 20,000 elements, right? They invest a lot of energy in, in maintaining these bill of materials to also have formal descriptions of these things. And what they can do is they can easily generate new process designs when the bill of material changes. So for example, if a supplier of a part from Korea, for example, when the supplier updates its product or when somebody else in, in the world, in Mexico, there was an alternative uh, sub-product that could replace a component in this bill of material, they can update that bill of material and they can then generate 
a new process design which incorporates and also purchases that part and takes the, consider takes the characteristics of that part into consideration in updating the process. So this, this, I think the, the, one of the benefits of this approach and perhaps one of the more important insights here is that product and process are related to an extent. And even if you cannot use the, the product description to fully uh, uh, develop a process, by maintaining the link between the characteristics of the product and the process, you can still benefit from updates in product specifications or in rules. For example, many organizations, they have to deal with policies uh, and policies lead to particular steps in the process. So you have to keep an eye on the policies and the updates on the policies to make sure that your process is also in sync with them, right? And many, I think many organizations forget that. They have a process and it's running Okay, let's, let's, let's keep on doing that. While well, you have to monitor whether the process is still generating the product, which is um, the desired product. Okay, right, uh, interesting. Um, any other questions from the audience? There's one, uh, okay, Tristan, please ask your question directly. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity. Can the process redesign become a temporary process? I mean, like before pandemic, some company used the plan that already redesigned, but in pandemic, they change. And after uh, the pandemic, they change uh, again to before pandemic activity like that. So I, I uh, recognize what you say that that organizations uh, who were redesigning perhaps put things on a hold, move back to processes that were already in place during the pandemic. And your question is whether this is a process itself? Yeah. Is it possible to have this kind of flexibility where, where you have a certain process and then yeah. during the pandemic you redesign it, but then after that, you go back to your previous uh, design. Is that what you mean, Tristan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's a that's a good question. So um, once again, it, it relates to a little bit of the flexibility of the process. Let me give you an example of uh, how uh, insurance companies in the Netherlands work. Uh, insurance companies who have um, uh, who sell car insurance, right? So one of the things that they do is that they have a sort of an intricate procedure when you try to claim your car damage, right? They have to check the damage. Uh, there's an expert who has to look at your damage if it's, if it's really big to assess uh, how much money it involves. Uh, there's contact with a um, car repair shop. Uh, so there are all kinds of these steps. However, when uh, an insurance company, when of it, of professionals of the insurance company see on the evening news that it's going to be freezing uh, the next day in the morning, they change a parameter of their process so that people who start in the Netherlands then crashing into each other because they cannot deal with the slippery roads and they crash into each other and they start filing uh, uh, cases all of a sudden. So you all of a sudden have hundreds of cases at the same time where you in the summertime, perhaps one or two in the same time period. They change the, the parameter of the process so that first claims are being processed and are approved. And only later, there is a, there is a, a complex check on whether these uh, damages were genuine. So they, it's the same process, but they have in fact two variants of the process already in place. And they can dynamically switch between which process is being used depending on the circumstances. And you can imagine, of course, that one variant is much more meticulous, is much, much more uh, careful than the other one. But if they would keep on insisting for all these hundreds of new complaints that they first have the damage assessed, you know, on a winter morning, then they will lose a lot of customers because they will be very unsatisfied with, with the way they are being helped. So I think this is perhaps a partial answer to your question that as an organization, you can, of course, you don't have, you don't have, have to keep up running one version of your process. You could have different versions which you choose from depending on the circumstances which you use. 
And of course, many organizations have only one version. But it's, I think, makes sense to think of different, different versions. OK. Um, is that OK, Trista? Yeah, that's OK. Thank you. Um, uh, just a minute, Akmal, because I need to read out the question in this chat who, from Firman. How to implement NEST method to change process to be more productive and more efficient. And in the, the interest of time, there's also another question from Cahaya Ningtyas and also from Akmal. So, yes. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> you, you need honest, to speak. To be honest, I'm, I'm not a real NEST expert. Um, uh, I, 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 I rather make I rather advertise the, the method <laughs> that I'm really a big expert about it. However, we are starting a, a PhD project in the Netherlands uh, as of January to start experimenting ourselves more with these design-led uh, uh, redesign methods where we also use physical spaces. So I expect that th this is actually a topic that we will do more research uh, about in the coming months and coming years. So I will become better at, at understanding these methods and also about giving advice. But if you want to talk with a real expert, I recommend you talk with Michael Roseman. Yeah. <laughs> right. And he's also, he's, he's close by, right? Australia. Oh, no. <laughs> Not that easy, though. Okay. So um, I would like to invite uh, Ibu Cahyaning just to ask the, her question because it's quite long and I think it's better for her to speak to you directly. Please, Ibu Cahaya Ningtyas. Thank you for the opportunity, Ibu Mahendrawati and Professor Rangers. Uh, I want to ask uh, for the factor, fail factors of redesign. You mentioned that one of the fail factors for redesign is spending a lot of time in analyzing as is. Uh, I suppose that as an analyst, we have to spend a little bit more time thinking in the SS model so we can know precisely where we are going to hit the problem. If we go about wrongly on a problem and we don't solve it while we already have spent resources and try to solve it, uh, those we will have wasted those resources and time. So I think uh, we exactly want to give solution without containing any waste, not a solution that perpetuates waste. So personally, that we need a little bit more time in analyzing as is. Please correct me if there is something wrong with my point of view, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I don't think there's anything wrong. No, I think it's a very good uh, analysis. Uh, so maybe I can use a characteristic of the NEST method uh, to, to address your concern. So one thing that I really like about this uh, approach is that it tries to make analysts think about different time horizons for change. Um, I mentioned that the, the method also encourages people to think about improvements that can be done within 20 days, while also uh, thinking beyond that time period, the 20 months or a couple of years. And I think that if, you th if the, the time horizon becomes longer, you need to do a more thorough analysis to build your design decisions upon. But for short-term improvements, things which are very obvious uh, that can be improved, that people complain about, which are perhaps not so difficult to change and perhaps also do not create that many risks you can act quickly. So I think the idea behind this fail factor is much more that you first want to have a complete picture of how you want to change things before you start doing any things. And this is, I think, this is something which really is a risk factor for many redesign projects. It is good for an organization to see results that, that follow up on a redesign project. But I also agree with you that you don't want to implement things if you haven't thought them through. But I think it's an opportunity to do both, to have so a very common, it's a consultant's term, I don't like to use it so often, but you know, you hear it everybody, everywhere, low hanging fruit, right? That is, that is the term which still captures what is, what is perhaps something that you could achieve in a project in the short run, while addressing bigger concerns on, on the basis of a more thorough analysis. Is, is that, is that, um, answering your, your question or your concern? 
Thank you, Professor. Okay. Um, it's actually, do you mind to take these last two questions? No, not at all. Okay. So, uh, Fata says you mentioned four criteria to measure each process quality, speed, um, dot, dot. Is it similar with my opinion about effectiveness and efficiency? Alhamdulillah. Um, okay, can you please, is it, is cost, uh, quality, speed, and flexibility are uh, similar to effect effectiveness and efficiency? Right, um, so I think you can translate some of the things to each other. They are not exactly the same, of course. Uh, you could say that efficiency is much related to the relation between uh, time and um, uh, time and cost, right? Um, effective, effectiveness has to do with uh, whether you're doing the, the, the right things. So I could subsume that on the quality. Is the quality of what you eventually deliver, is that appropriate? So that's a sort of way of looking at effectiveness. Uh, but clearly, there are different words for these concepts, so they mean a little bit, they mean different things. So what I like about this model that I discussed is that it is, uh, it is rather elaborate, it has four dimensions, so it's, it's, it, it uh, allows you to talk in a, in a bit more specific way about what you mean when you are improving the performance of a process, but you can... I'm, I'm not uh, very strict about that these are the four ones, but I found them very useful uh, in practice to, to, and they're also under, un, understandable to business people uh, in this term. So if I got these questions, what is effectiveness? And I would say, well, uh, if you deliver if the quality of the product or the service is appropriate, then your process is effective. Efficiency, well, if, you, if the time to carry out that process is low and you don't have to spend much uh, resource on it, yeah, you, the execution cost is low, then the process is also efficient. And if they are in a good balance, if they are effective and efficient, that's actually what you want to achieve in the process. But in that case, the, yeah. All right. Um, sorry. Uh, now, Akma, can I invite you for your last question, please? Okay. Uh, thank you, Buhaymanga and Professor Reyes for the opportunity. So what I want to ask is uh, about the process for, uh, product versus process innovation. So I've been uh, observing the diagrams and it is said that the rate of innovation is always declining as the stage of development is progressing. And the rate of process innovation is always uh, increasing as the stage of development is increasing. Uh, why is that? And is it possible that both of these uh, respective innovation, but the product and process innovation is going uh, parallel with each other as they are going in line with each other. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Let me first make a general remark. I, I really appreciate how polite everybody is. Uh, thanking me for the opportunity to ask questions, it's really a pleasure. <laughs> so I want to compliment everybody. Um, and I'm also hoping that my Dutch students are watching and take an example. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the, the model that these economists developed is actually an empirical model. So they observed how it happens within existing organizations. So it, it tells much more about how organizations are used to do it, right? to, to first invest in, in, in product innovation and gradually move into a process innovation approach. So this is the typical pattern that, uh, that happens. It's not of course, excluding uh, the possibility that you could do these things more in a hand-of-hand -hand way, but it's not really happening for many organizations. What I do see happening is that organizations, uh, maybe because it's too complex to invest your energy and time in both of these things, I'm not sure, but that could be an explanation. But what I also see is that some organizations mostly skip the product innovation part and, and jump to the process innovation as the major vehicle uh, to be competitive or to gain gain market share, so that that's my understanding of the uh, uh, what is happening in, in organizations with respect to product and process innovation. Okay, there is one more question. Sorry, uh, this is going to be the last one. Uh, yes, please. Um, 
would I'm sorry, this is uh, Pak Bariki. Would you like to ask him? Yes, uh, thank you for the chances. So uh, we found that is it difficult and also risky to redesign process. And if a company success to bring up a new process design, the next challenge is how to make the process run and perform well by all process participants. Is there are any standard way uh, to how to implement new process design so that all process can be performed in correct way by all process participants? Thank you for that uh, question. I think there was there are many facets aspects uh, that should be emphasized. So it's it's not at all easy. One of the things which I see I can I can tell you uh, a little bit more more in, 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 in a general form is something which I see in the literature, but which I also have seen in my own experience as a consultant is that it's extremely important to address concerns, small problems very quickly. So if you implement something new. There's no better way to, let's say, dissatisfy people by not listening to the problems they have with carrying out their this new process or even using a new system. My experience is also that the, the problems that bother people, the things that bother people are often very trivial things. They have to do with a button which, they, which is not well placed on their screen or it is something that is unclear what is actually expected from them at a, at, a, at a certain stage. Well, this is not so difficult, uh, but somebody needs to explain that to the person, right? So this kind of follow-up, this kind of operational support, fixing small issues, uh, fixing small problems, addressing concerns, and also, of course, having a platform to collect these kind of, uh, to collect this kind of feedback, that's crucial. It's crucial. I've seen in, so, in many big organizations, this is actually a big problem that there was such a distance between, let's say, the, the redesign team and the people on the work floor, and that there was no connection between these, these groups, right? So people who see the operational problems cannot interact with the redesign uh, team. Where, I seen, where I've seen that process redesign is much more successfully applied is that this connection is much closer, either through technology, because there's a platform where people can raise questions, or people, redesign teams, start working around, start also looking at the effects of what they have developed and designed on the work floor. So I think this is, I think there are many more things that, that could be said, but I, um, my uh, take on what is, what is the most important thing is, is, is this. Okay, thank you. I think, um, I mean, uh, we can carry on with the question and answer, but uh, I think it's uh, the in, the in the interest of time. Uh, I think we have to stop there. So thank you very much again for a very uh, to rough presentation. And also um, I would like to thank also all the audience that are uh, joining in today. So as you can see, they are creating um, a special virtual background for you. Maybe if you are interested to use it later. <laughs> So uh, the, the one that's uh, using the same virtual background is, of course, IDS student. But I'm also very pleased that at one point we have 250, over 250 uh, participants and also coming all the way from Spain. Thank you very much, Adela and Andres. And also we have uh, from, I think, uh, all over Indonesia and not just from Surabaya. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this wonderful opportunity. And I think, uh, Pak Muja, would you like to say something or should I close this session? Terima kasih. Thank you, Mr. Hejo. I hope we can meet again at another event. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, and uh, Ibu Ika, do you need to take a picture or something? Ibu Ika? Oh, sorry, it's muted. <laughs> yes, it would be great if we take a picture together. All right, okay. So do we yes. need to, the, what about this? Stop uh, the screen share? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. All right. So there's going to uh, be a lot of pages. Yeah, it's nine pages. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So bear with us. We love our pictures a lot. Okay. So we start from the first page. Everyone ready? Three, two, one. Uh, hold on. <laughs> it's liking. Okay. Uh, hold a second. 
Oops. So it's lagging. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to take a long time. <laughs> yes. Now. So who's in number two? Page yeah, page two. number two. Three, two, one. All right. I think we don't need to do all. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just after page three, maybe. Okay. All right. Three, three, yes, just three. only for the administration purpose. Thank you yes. very much, everybody. So yes. with this, I will close the session. Thank you very much. And hopefully we will be able Thank to see you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Sir. All right. Sampai bertemu lagi. Ah, now you said it after everybody's gone. <laughs> no, please have a seat first. Uh, oh, Raja. Standing for a long time. Bye. Yes. I don't know who's talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll just wait here until everybody's left. I'll make a short stop. I'll sure, be back. Please, yeah, please. Thank you. Terima kasih, Noval. May I leave now, ma'am? Yes, please. I mean, you. Uh, apa? Kok saya jadi ngomong bahasa Inggris lu? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's sudah. okay. It's okay. Sudah boleh. Terima kasih semuanya. Thank you. Ya. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bu Mahendra, untuk recordingnya mungkin apa nanti bakal di share atau enggak? Uh, ada di YouTube. 